Uh, welcome to our brown bag program today. While you while you're here, if you have not seen our special quilt exhibit, I want to invite you to tour once upon a thread that's downstairs on our ground level. We are the only U.S. venue for that exhibit, and it's fascinating to look at. It will be here till July 2nd, so please take a look. Um, our brown bag programs are held once a month on the second Wednesday at noon, and it's great to see such a, a good crowd today. Our program coming up in July, uh, July 12th, uh, is entitled Eating in the Old Days, and um, that I'm sure that will be a fun program to listen to. Alice Wolfgang will be presenting um, the program based on food historian Nancy Rowan's uh, research notes on Pennsylvania Dutch culinary treats. And today our speaker is Ed Johnson. Um, he is president of the Goshenhoffen Historians. He's a retired history teacher, and he's going to be talking on the Philadelphia Road. I don't know how we got places before GPS, let alone having to travel on uh, with horse and wagon, um, but Ed is gonna share some of the interesting history behind a major route of commerce and travel. Ed? Thank you, sir. As Sarah said, I'm president of the Gosh and Hoppin Historians. Since January 1999, I do promise that when the time comes, I will leave office. And I, I taught at Penn Ridge High School for 35 years, actually 34 years. One year I was uh, at the elementary level. And I see Claire Ryman in the back, who was one of my colleagues there for many years. And I do still, even though I've been retired since 2014, I do still have my teacher voice. So I know that we have a microphone for the benefit of the Zoom people. Uh, if you can't hear me in the back, I'll make sure you can. And with that, the Great Wagon Road, Indian Trail to Highway of the New Republic. The Great Wagon Road was the most traveled land transportation route of the colonial period and the period of the early Republic. Its route was determined by the geography of the region, especially the eastern ridges of the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Valley of Virginia. It stretched from Philadelphia to Lancaster, York, and Gettysburg through Maryland down the Valley of Virginia past Stanton, through the Carolinas, all the way to Augusta, Georgia. During the colonial period, the region was covered, I'm sorry, here I am reading my notes and I do read my notes because I was never one for winging it, um, except for the time at Lifelong Learning uh, over at the uh, New Goshenhofen Church when I forgot my notes and uh, pretty panicked. Um, so, sorry, here we go. There's the correct first slide, uh, June 14th. And there's the uh, region that the wagon road went through. And there is an actual map showing its route all the way uh, from Philadelphia, Lancaster, York, Gettysburg, Winchester, Harrisonburg, there's Stanton. Uh, all the way down here to Augusta. During the colonial period, the region was covered by a thick forest of various coniferous and deciduous trees, especially the hardy chestnut. The image that comes to mind is of a squirrel being able to jump branch to branch, tree to tree, to the Mississippi River. Of course, there were clearings, but it is a nice mental image. I'm gonna get used to this, yeah, there we go. Clark Rouse Jr. wrote the book On the Road, which I found at Forefathers Bookshop in Reversburg, northeast of State College. According to Rouse, the story of the great Philadelphia wagon road is the story of the rise of this region, 
which became the first Western frontier of the American nation created in 1789. The road was a vital conduit for migration to the frontier and for agricultural products to market. Again, according to Rouse, the story of the great Philadelphia wagon road is the story of German and Scotch-Irish settlement in America. And here is uh, Rouse's book. If you would like to take a look, I did bring along the books that I used to gather information for this talk. You can take a look at those at the end of the talk. The Great Wagon Road began as trails formed by animals, especially the Eastern wood bison. American Indians followed these animal trails, using them for warfare and trade all the way from the Great Lakes to Georgia. As white settlers entered the region, they came into conflict with the Indians using the warrior's path for their own purposes. A treaty negotiated in Albany, New York in 1722 limited tribal use of the path to north of the Potomac River and west of the Blue Ridge. This led to increased use of the warrior's path by whites. In 1683, Francis Daniel Pastorius, an educator, lawyer, and poet arrived in Philadelphia from the Duchy of Franconia. His first residence was a cave dug in the bank of the Delaware River. On behalf of a group of Mennonites, Pietists, and Quakers, he negotiated the purchase of 15,000 acres from William Penn and founded Germantown. Two years later, Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes. This removed protections for Calvinists in France and led to an exodus and warfare. Over the next few decades, over 60,000 Germans entered Pennsylvania. These immigrants experienced a certain level of hostility. James Logan, colonial secretary to William Penn wrote, we have many thousands of ye foreigners, most palatines, so-called already in ye country, of whom near 1,500 came in this last summer. Many of them are a surly people, divers papists among them, and ye men generally well-armed. In 1751, Benjamin Franklin wrote, why should the Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlement and by herding together, establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania founded by the English become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglicizing them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Rather unkind words there from Franklin, he lived to take it back as he learned more about the, uh, the Germans who settled here in Pennsylvania. He gathered, uh, gained quite a bit of respect for them. Sorry. Facing increased resentment, many newcomers headed on the great warrior's path in search of cheaper farmland in Maryland and Virginia. Oops. Uh, uh, many of the migrants were farmers. Every year they loaded sheaves into wagons. More than one source made special mention of the superior farming skills of the Germans as others wore out the soil, especially by growing tobacco, Germans bought the land and succeeded in replenishing the soil with the introduction of manure. Others were skilled tradesmen.
Among the tradesmen were wheelwrights and wagon builders who developed the Conestoga wagon. Contrary to popular belief, these wagons were not watertight and had no buoyancy, so they were not floated across rivers. A wagon like this one could carry three tons of goods. It is con considered a medium-sized Conestoga wagon and was built about 1840 by an unknown maker. It is in the State Museum of Pennsylvania and was donated by A. Atwater Kent, Jr. This wagon was owned by the Orndorff family of Franklin County when the photograph was taken in 1906. Note that the wagoner typically controlled his team from the horse on the left nearest the wagon, not from the wagon itself. Roger Dietrich, a recently deceased member of the Gosh and Hoppin historians, built a wonderful scale model of a Conestoga wagon. I wish I had it here to show you. In lieu of that, take a look downstairs and you'll see one. This is a very good source on the Conestoga wagon. It places the wagon in its place in history as well as the culture. It also serves as a technical manual showing line drawings of the wagon box, wheels, running gear, rigging, etc. I found it at Merle's Bookshop in Hallowell, Maine. My twin daughters for a time lived, both lived in Maine and Hallowell's was a, a regular stop for me. The following images will give you an idea of what this book is like. This wagon was driven by Abraham Weber from Lancaster County to Waterloo County, Ontario in 1807. It is probably in such good condition because it was removed from Pennsylvania and used sparingly in a community with good barns, short growing seasons, and long winter. I am not an expert on wagons, but these pictures show details of the Weber wagon. These Pennsylvania Dutch who headed to Ontario did so in the decades following the American Revolution. Some sought cheap land. Some were pacifists who were considered by patriots to be one step away from Tories. Others had emigrated to Pennsylvania before the revolution and had sworn an oath of loyalty to the crown. And for them, that was for good and always. That story is recounted in G. Elmore Raymond's 1957 book, The Trail of the Black Wand. This one I got down at Baldwin's Book Barn outside of Westchester. And the, the Trail of Black Wand is, is it's, it's not a specific trail, but as they were headed north to Canada, they looked for black walnut trees because they knew that black walnut trees tended to grow in limestone rich soil. And that's what they wanted. Okay. The other major immigrant group using the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road were the Scots Irish. Rouse uses both Scotch Irish and Scots Irish. Uh, I prefer the Scots Irish. Many of them were descended from lowland Scots who after 1607 were introduced, induced to colonize Ireland with the promise of cheap farming. While many continued farming, some became skilled linen and woolen weavers. As they became prosperous, the Irish and British parliaments began a campaign of political and business persecution. Soon, the fiercely independent Scots 
Irish began looking elsewhere to seek their fortune. The Exodus began about 1718. It became a flood after 1740. Many left Belfast for Philadelphia. This is a scene just a couple blocks from the docks in Philadelphia. Rouse refers to High Street, now known as Market Street, as the most historic highway in America. This map of early Philadelphia showing William Penn's grid plan with the development part of the city shown in brown. And it may not be real easy to see that. It's sort of reddish brown here. So when we think of Philadelphia and the, the expansive city that it became, um, when Ben Franklin arrived from Boston as a young man, and he took a walk from the city to the Schuylkill River, he walked through farmland. This 1926 book by Joseph Jackson is a very detailed block by block account of the history of Market Street that I also found at Baldwin's Book Barn. Written by Jackson, published by John Wanamaker. And it goes block by block, starting at the river, headed west, as the city expanded west, who lived there, what businesses were there, a uh, very interesting look at colonial Philadelphia. The family of Andrew Pickens came into Philadelphia before 1720 from Ulster. Rouse relates their story. They first went westward to Paxton Township near the later town of Harrisburg. There was born the second Andrew Pickens, one of several members of the family to become famous, who was to command the South Carolinian forces in the American Revolution. Like many emigrants, however, they continued to be attracted to lands to the south, which were farther removed from the ominous threat of the Iroquois tribesmen north of, Phil of Pennsylvania. Accordingly, the family pulled up stakes in the 1730s loaded their horses with the family goods and started south over the warrior's path toward the cheaper lands in Virginia. Crossing the Potomac River by Williams or Watkins Ferry near the later site of Williamsport, they followed the narrow footpath along the Shenandoah River. Past occasional clearings in the forest of the Valley of Virginia, they came after many days journey to a gap in an earlier trail called Buffalo Gap. There, 17 miles southwest of the Valley Way Station, which grew into the, the town of Stanton, the Pickens family cleared land and farmed for nearly 20 years. When the colony of Virginia introduced government in the Valley in 1745 and created Augusta County, the elder Andrew Pickens became the first justice of the peace. But the lore of the wilderness still called and these and other pioneers moved on. About 1750, Andrew Pickens led his family southward again, following the warrior's path into the land of the Waxhaw Indians in southern, I'm sorry, in western South Carolina. Ten years later, they moved to Abbeville, where the younger Andrew grew to fame. In the meantime, Troubles with Indians persisted. The Treaty of Albany of 1722 recognized the Blue Ridge Mountains as the demarcation line between the five, soon to be six nations, and the Virginia colony. In the 1730s, white settlers kept crossing the Blue Ridge into the Shenandoah Valley. When the six nations objected, they were told that the dividing line was to prevent their trespassing east of the Blue Ridge, not to prevent the English expanding to the west. 
Skirmishing in 1743 endangered settlers and disrupted travel on the warrior's path and nearly led to total war. In 1744, the two sides met at Lancaster for two weeks of negotiations and rum. The Six Nations agreed to sell all their remaining claim to the Shenandoah Valley, bringing peace to the road. There is a connection with the wagon road to Faulkner Swamp, just to the west of here, and Henry Antes. Antes emigrated to Pennsylvania at the age of 19 in 1720. With his partner, William Deweese, he built the second paper mill in America. He married his partner's daughter, Christina Elizabeth, and their first child, Anna Katharina, was born in 1726. He became associated with Methodist George Whitfield, Moravian Count, uh, Bishop Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, and Moravian Bishop August Gottlieb Spangenberg. Antes was very instrumental in the establishment of the Moravian community at Bethlehem, signing the deed for the property in 1741. And that was all that. To the left is an image of early Bethlehem. To the right, Nazareth and Lydis. Antes became disenchanted with the Moravian leadership at Bethlehem and moved his family back to the plantation in 1750. He was then invited to lay out the new Moravian settlement at Salem, North Carolina. He died at home in 1755. And if it wasn't raining this afternoon, I'd be over there mowing the cemetery where he's buried. Meanwhile, Katharina had felt moved to remain in Bethlehem and married Dr. Hans Martin Halverham in 1758. They were sent to Bethabara uh, the following year when the good doctor died from fever epidemic. She next married Philip Christian Gottlieb Ruder, who built her a house. All right, so that's second husband. He was a surveyor and passed to the great beyond in 1777. And three years later, Katharina married Caspar Heinzman, pastor of Friedland Moravian Church. He met his maker in 1783. Next. <laughs> Next was Jacob Ernst, pastor of Beth Bethabar and Moravian Church, who breathed his last in 1802. In the meantime, the house had been converted to the widow's house, and uh, Katharina returned to it after Ernst's death and lived there until her death in 1860. I, I sort of joke that well, if they wanted to get rid of one of their, their uh, Moravian ministers, they married her off to uh, Katharina. And there's, there's that litany of... Uh... Okay. Um, this book, uh, 1944, was written by Antti's descendant and Moravian scholar, Dr. Adelaide Fries. I found it by chance at the book barn. It is a fictionalized memoir based on Anna Katharina's diary and other Moravian records. There are many fascinating stories I encountered along the way. One of the most disturbing was from this book. It happened in 1779 during the revolution and freeze through Katharina was telling an acquaintance about losses due to theft by deserters 
and by others who hoped the blame would fall on the deserters. To quote, for example, our Negro Jacob, he was a provisional member of the congregation and we thought of him as a reliable man and took every care of him when he contracted smallpox in the last epidemic. But he had hardly recovered when we began to miss things at the tavern, at Sister Reuter's, and at the brother's house. We suspected the stranger that then suddenly discovered that Jacob was the thief. Of course, he was whipped. And that night, one of our horses died of poison. He was forced to admit that he had killed it out of spite and was whipped again, but it did not lead him to repentance. So he was sold to Robert Lanier, who lives 12 miles away near the shallow ford of the Yadkin River. She was asked what she got for him. And again, to quote, 100 bushels of oats, 250 bushels of corn, 130 bushels of rye, six bulls, 2,000 pounds of hog meat. Half to be paid before the end of the year and half the next year. Barter is far more satisfactory than money these years. Another part of the story of the great Philadelphia wagon road is the story of Daniel Boone and the Wilderness Road. That road branched off from the great wagon road in the far southwest corner of Virginia, went through the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that part of the story, but if you are interested in it, seek out Robert Kincaid's 1947 book, which is part of the American Trails series. Road conditions continued to be abysmal. An Indian trail from the Delaware to the Susquehanna River was followed by a bridle path pushed through by settlers. According to John T. Farris, within 30 years, there was a road of a sort between Philadelphia and the Dutch settlements on the Conestoga. This was the great Conestoga Road. A petition was sent to the Provincial Council in 1730, which said that not having the conveniency of any navigable water for bringing the produce of the laborers to Philadelphia, they are obliged at a great expense to transport them by land carriage, which burthen becomes heavier through the want of suitable roads for carriages to pass that there are no public roads leading to Philadelphia yet laid out through this community and those in Chester County through which they now pass are in many places incommodious. By 1741, work was completed on what became known as the Old Philadelphia Road. General Forbes used it on his way to Fort Duquesne in 1758. Periodic attempts were made to improve the road, during, uh, but during the revolution, continues, uh, conditions were still generally poor. The financial depression that followed the war was severe, but Pennsylvanians still dreamt of a new Lancaster Road. The condition of roads during the early days of the Republic continued to be poor. In 1778, Elizabeth Drinker, went from Philadelphia to Lancaster. In her diary, she wrote, in our journey today, we found the road so bad that we walked part of ye west and climbed three fences to get clear of ye mud. On another day, she wrote, this day we forded three large rivers, the Conestoga ye last, which came into ye carriage and wet our feet and frightened more than one of us. An unknown diarist told of a trip for pleasure, left 
Lancaster in good spirits, but alas, a sad accident had like to have turned our mirth into mourning. For W, driving careless and being happily engaged with the lady he had the pleasure of riding with, and not mindful enough of his charge, drove against a large stump which stood in the way, by which the chair was overturned and the lady thrown out to a considerable distance, but happily received no hurt. A 1789 account, the road was so rough and the load was so heavy that the axle soon cracked and the stage dropped to the road. Fortunately, nobody was injured, so the party extricate themselves and footed it, Indian style, to the nearest inn, about two miles distant. After eating dinner, they persuaded a countryman to take them on to the next stage of the journey. His team proved to be a country wagon with sp no springs or cover, with no seats other than bundles of rye straw. However, all agreed that the wagon was better than walking. These stories are related in Old Roads Out of Philadelphia by John T. Farris, published in 1917. Another wonderful book by the same author is Old Trails and Roads in Penn's Woods, published in 1927. He wrote a whole series of books that were published by Lippincott and uh, very, very interesting on the development of taverns and churches in Philadelphia, very interested in, in regional history. Finally, on April 7th, 1792, a charter was issued. According to the charter, the road was to run from the west side of the Schuylkill River opposite the city of Philadelphia, so as to pass over the bridge on Brandywine Creek near Downingtown, from thence to Whitmer's Bridge on the Conestoga Creek, and thence to the east end of King Street, where the buildings cease in the borough of Lancaster. The road was to be built according to construction methods that went back to Roman rule in Britain. Jackson, in his book about Market Street, describes the, cons the construction. First, they made parallel furrows along the line of the road. And after removing all the loose earth between these bounds and having reached the hard earth, they then filled in the trench with fine earth, well packed to make it firm. Small square stones were carefully laid on this foundation, and usually fresh mortar excuse me, was poured over them. Upon this, small broken stone mixed with lime was thrown in. Then came another stratum consisting, consisting of broken stone, lime, chalk, gravel, and broken tile, all mixed with clay. These four layers only formed the foundation for the roadway, which was the final layer. This consisted of larger cut stones, sometimes as large as flagstones, and usually of the size of granite paving blocks. Sometimes the roadway itself was composed of a mixture of gravel and lime. This produced a street or road that was higher than the surrounding land, hence, high street, and highway. Stock in the road was advertised at $300 per share. Each share was a sheepskin document, one sheepskin per share. At the top of the picture uh, was a picture of the road with a Conestoga wagon approaching a toll gate. The total cost of the project was $464,142.31 for a 70-mile 
road. The road was a huge success and immediately became congested with wagons heading in both directions. On a side note, there is a connection to Thomas Paine, the very influential essayist of common sense and the rights of man. It seems he was also an architect, what we would today call an engineer. He designed an iron bridge to be built across the Schuylkill River to join Philadelphia and the road to Lancaster, where there was nothing but the middle ferry, the middle of three ferries on the Schuylkill River. It was never built. Edward G. Gray's 2016 book tells that story. The economies of colonial Maryland and Virginia were based on the cultivation of tobacco. Tobacco quickly depletes the soil of nutrients. The soil takes about 20 years to recover naturally. Small growers tended to move on when the soil wore out. Large planters could move cultivation from one part of the plantation to another, keeping parts fallow to recover. As time went on, many planters moved south and west to grow cotton. Here's an image of a couple of slaves on the great wagon road headed from Virginia to Tennessee. In some cases, Germans bought worn out land and prospered as they knew how to restore the soil using manure. This is a reprint of two books about the national road which was the first national internal improvement project of the United States. It ran from Cumberland, Maryland to Wheeling, West, what is now West Virginia, then Virginia. It basically it follows what is now US 40. C. Wright's 1894 book, The Old Pike, is a great source of information about wagoners. Apparently that is the term that they used. Beamster came into use later. He described Alfred Bales as, quote, probably the oldest man living who drove a team on the national road. He was first a wagoner and subsequently, and for many years, a stage driver. He was born in Loudoun County, Virginia, and came upon the road about the year 1830 at the solicitation of John Bradfield, who was also a native of Virginia, an agent of the first line of wagons on the road. Bales was born in 1804, and although closely approaching his 90th year, his eye is undimmed and his natural vigor unabated. Bales was one of the most commanding figures on the road, upwards of six feet in height, with broad chest and shoulders and long arms. As a driver, he performed his functions faithfully and carefully. He is a most interesting relic of the road and his memory is well stored with interesting reminiscences of its faded glory. Also from Seawright, there was an old wagoner whose name was Hill and he lived at Triadelphia now in West Virginia, who never drove his team on Sunday. He seems not to have lost anything by resting his team and himself on Sunday, for he made as good time on his trips as any other wagoner, and in the end became rich. Seawright was writing over a hundred years ago, and I think he had a delightful turn of phrase. Michael Teeters, a spluttering old wagoner, was noted for his profanity. He was possessed with a fatal delusion that hard swearing was evidence of superior intelligence. Hard to argue. He, of course, had some good traits as the worst of men have. But when age and infirmity came upon him, he exchanged the tramp over the hills of the old pike 
for a walk over the hills to the poorhouse. He died in the county home of Washington County, Pennsylvania. Had he followed the example of Hill, who rested on Sunday, it may not be said of that he would have grown rich, but it is pretty certain that the surroundings of his dying hours would have been different from what they were. Ashel Willison, another of the old wagoners, is still living in Cumberland at the time the book was written, and one of the most prominent citizens of that place. He was postmaster at Cumberland during the first administration of President Cleveland. From the saddle horse of a six horse team on the old pike to the control of the city post office is distinctively an American idea and a good one. The old wagoner made a capital postmaster. Mr. Willison is now deputy collector of internal revenue for the state of Maryland. Robert Allison, one of the best known of the old wagoners was a fighting man. He did not seem to be quarrelsome, yet was often by the same sort of untoward destiny involved in pugilistic encounters along the road. In one of these at Rear's Tavern on Kaiser's Ridge, he bit off the nose of a stage driver. Seawright included a clipping from a Philadelphia newspaper concerning the Toby. It appears that in the old days, the drivers on the Codis of the Conestoga wagons, so common years ago on our national road, used to buy cheap cigars. To meet this demand, a small cigar manufacturer in Washington, Pennsylvania, whose name is lost to fame, started, whoops, started, started in to make a cheap roll up for them at four for a penny. They became very popular with the drivers who were the at first called Conestoga cigars. Since by usage corrupted into stogies and tobies. Virginia, I'm sorry, uh, it is now estimated that Pennsylvania and West Virginia produce about 200 million tobies annually, probably all for home consumption. Seawright also wrote about taverns and tavern keepers. Some taverns were very small, while some, like this one, uh, Mount Washington Tavern, were quite large. This is the Wayside Inn on the Boston Post Road in Sadbury, Massachusetts. It is run by a nonprofit foundation and claims that it is the oldest operating inn in the nation, dating back to 1807. I visited it on my way home from Maine after one of those visits to my twin daughters. Seawright wrote about the bar rooms at the taverns on the National Road. The bar was stocked with whiskey of the purest distillation. The bottles used were of plain glass, each marked in large letters with the name of the liquor it contained. And the landlord would place these bottles on the narrow counter in the presence of a room filled with wagoners so that all could have free access to them. None of the old tavern keepers made profit from the sale of liquor. They kept it more for the accommodation of their guests than for money making purposes. A memorable feature of the taverns was the fires kept constantly burning in the old bar rooms during the winter. In many cases, the great were seven feet long and could keep a wagon loaded with uh, uh, keep a load yes a wagon load of coal. The old landlords took special pride in keeping up the fire. He kept a poker from six to eight feet in length and would not allow it to be used by anyone but himself. Boss Rush was so careful and punctilious about the management of his barroom fire that he kept his big poker under lock and key.
What ended the glory days of the old roads was the development of the railroad. This was especially true of the National Road, again from C. Wright's book. When at last the Conestoga horse yielded up the palm to the iron horse, it became manifest that the glory of the old road was departing, never to return. The old wagoners, many of whom had spent their best days on the road, sang in chorus the following lament. Now all ye jolly wagoners who have got good wives, go home to your farms and there spend your lives. When your corn is all cribbed and your small grain is good, you'll have nothing to do but curse the railroad. If you Google Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, you can find present day road numbers and names that follow the old road as closely as possible. I mean, you get a long list working from Philadelphia, west and south, and you, you can follow it. Again, where it hasn't been altered. Don't take the Route 30 bypass around Lancaster. <laughs> but basically we're talking Market Street of Philadelphia, Lancaster Avenue, and then Lancaster Turnpike, the Lincoln Highway, and US 11, down all the way down uh, through the Valley of Virginia. And that's my talk. Thank you. Questions? Good, good luck with it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's in, in Salem, with, uh, now Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Henry Yancey's daughter, Katharina, where was her house? Uh, that was in the, the new, then, new Moravian community of Salem in North Carolina, and it's, it's still a historic site. Yes. Mm. Still under any of these highways? The, the question is uh, are any of the old Roman style roads underneath what are, are now uh, current highways? In the United States, I can't answer that. I know that in Europe, there, there are still Roman roads that are used. Um, another, uh, I didn't deal with this because it wasn't really a specific part of the Great Wagon Road, but Two other constructions of roads that were interesting was what one was called a corduroy road, corduroy like the ribbed fabric. Um, that was where you took logs and laid them in a, in a wet spot on a road parallel to each other. And so, so the, the wagon would cross them perpendicular. And uh, you know that was a way to get over some wet spots. Also, there, were, uh, there was a street in Philadelphia called, and I don't know the pronunciation, C-A-M-A-C, Kamak Street, Kamak, sorry, Kamak Street, which uh, was a wooden street. And that had about four by four blocks of wood that was the surface uh, with the end grain up. Uh, that street, uh, had some real serious heaving a few years ago and uh, was paved over with macadam, uh, but I understand that there, there is a, an effort perhaps to restore it. I believe there is one uh, wooden street still existing in Pittsburgh. Yes. Okay, great. Could be. It's in interesting to see. Yeah. There's a question online, is Allentown Road a main wagon road? Yes, yes. Um, there were, se the, the question uh, was Allentown Road a main wagon road? Uh, there were several roads out of Philadelphia that were really major thoroughfares. Um, the Skipback Pike, which went to uh, obviously the Skipback, but then on 
eventually to uh, Boyer, uh, Gilbertsville, Boyertown, uh, on to Ole. Um, the, what is now the, called the Old Bethlehem Road, which, um, how can I tell you? Uh, if you follow um, uh, from, from Line Lexington, Mincy Trail in Hilltown Township, and then it becomes the Old Bethlehem Road and crosses 313 and goes up to where the Lake House restaurant used to be and goes down into Lake now, Lake Nakamexon, and goes up the other side and went on up to Bethlehem. And then there was Bethlehem Pike, which is the old road that went past the White Horse Tavern at Sellersville. Um, and then that was replaced in the 20s by the new Bethlehem Pike, a three-lane highway. So then the other became Old Bethlehem Pike, and then that was replaced by the 309 Expressway. But the Allentown Road went from Chestnut Hill. Uh, I'm sorry, did not go from Chestnut Hill. Uh, that's Bethlehem Pike. It went from uh, right across from where Le um, Merck is at Wales Junction and cross Broad Street of Lansdale where um, Martin Derry was. And they used in their advertising a wagon with the Liberty Bell on it and uh, went on up to um, Ridge Valley to Trimbarsville, to uh, Coopersburg, and on up to Allentown. And which of those roads was used to transport the Liberty Bell is a matter of debate. Um, it was kept for a time in Quakertown, which kind of leads you to think, well, maybe it was Bethlehem Pike. Um, but like I said, Martin Dairy used, uh, you know, they like to say it went right past the dairy. Um, so anyway, yeah, Allentown Road is, is one of the old roads. Well, if you have other questions, if you'd like to take a look at the books that I brought along, uh, please feel, feel welcome. And I'd like to thank the uh, Schwenkfelder Her Library and Heritage Center for having me today and to give this talk for the second time. Thank you. Thank you.